Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hi, everyone. This is Katana Abbott, and I want to welcome you to Smart Women Talk. Today, we are going to be speaking with nationally known estate planning attorney, Daniel Mayoris, about common sense advice to help people make sure that their medical and financial wishes are followed in the event of a disability or death through proper estate planning. And I know that you're thinking, ugh, that's the last thing I want to hear about, but we're going to make it fun seriously. (laughs) And this is such an important topic. So we're going to share things like the types of estate planning that you need in place for the different stages of your life. We'll talk about tips you need to know for the holidays, because you're going to be seeing lots of family members and this year end legal planning that needs to be done. And then how to engage, you know, your family members in these estate planning conversations to motivate them to do their proper estate planning. So, but first, let me tell you about Danielle. This is her third time back to Smart Women Talk, and I've known her for many, many years. She is a nationally known attorney, author, and on-camera media expert. She is a shareholder at BRMM Law, where she provides estate elder law and special needs planning. In addition to her legal practice, Danielle authored the best-selling book, Trial and Heirs, Famous Fortune Fights, and has been a regular contributor for Forbes, as well as presented on a variety of legal topics around the country for audiences ranging from financial advisors and attorneys to social workers and nonprofits. She has served as a legal expert for hundreds of publications and TV shows like CNN, NBC Nightly News, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, The Huffington Post, ABC News, The Rachel Ray Show, Access Hollywood, Fox, PBS, and NBC. So welcome, Danielle, to Smart (laughs) Women Talk. That was a mouthful, but wow. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to today. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So we've known each other for a long, long time. I think it's been decades. Yeah, I've been doing this for a while. You've been doing this for a while. And I think if it's possible, I think we met maybe in like 2007, 2008. Yes, yes, that's true. And back then we were both working in the community and we were doing outreach programs. It was right when I launched the Smart Women's Coaching Program and the Smart Women's Empowerment, but we were doing things on caregiving and I had the designated daughter program and we did panel discussions and just all kinds of advocacy for women. And so I'm so thrilled we're back here today because you know, honestly, uh, we just, I just did a show with Wayne Titus, who's a financial advisor and CPA. This was in our last show. And we talked about the whole thing, taxes and finances and tax harvesting your um, gains and losses. And, oh my, it's like, I know women don't want to talk about this. And then Danielle, when we talk about estate planning, is this really all about death and dying? I mean, because people don't want to talk about this. And I know it's not true. (laughs) It doesn't have to be. Oftentimes, you know, I call it the dreaded conversation because no one wants to think about it. But really, when we talk about estate planning, it's truly an act of love, not only for yourself, so you're protected medically and financially, but also for your loved ones, because there's really no greater act of love that you can do than planning for your own future and also for the future of those that you love to make sure your assets go to who you want, how you want, the way you want. I want people to see how many things this encompasses. And then you're not rushing around and going to court. So I agree. I think so many people, when they think of estate planning, they think of money, they think of assets. 
but a huge part of estate planning are medical decisions. And, you know, sometimes the financial decisions can wait, but the medical decisions can't. And that's why it's so critical that everyone over the age of 18 have a medical and financial power of attorney. And, you know, a lot of times people think you just shared a story about your stepfather that people have to be old to do estate planning. Absolutely not. Once you're 18, the very least you should do is have medical and financial durable power of attorneys. Because if you don't, when you're 18, your parents can no longer make your medical or financial decisions. So God forbid there's an accident or something happens, your parents would have to go through the probate court to make your medical and financial decisions. So when my three kids turned 18, of course, I made sure they had power of attorneys right on their 18th birthday, because God forbid if something happened, I didn't want to go through the court system with them. And that's really critical. So there's different stages of life where we need estate planning. And really, the first one is at age 18. If you have a properly drafted medical and financial power of attorney, it allows your designees to make a lot of different decisions. On the medical side, if it's drafted properly, they can decide care, like what you were talking about for your stepfather. They can talk to doctors, they can access medical records, surgery, medication, mental health issues even, and termination of life support, which in different states, it's called different things, whether it's a living will or patient advocate. And then on the financial end, when someone needs help paying bills, investing money, buying and selling real estate, you know, that falls under the financial power of attorney. But it's important to understand that these documents, there's not like a form that attorneys use. So medical and financial power of attorneys, just like all legal documents, they're drafted by the attorney. And it's really important that not that you know, individuals don't just have these documents, that they have good and comprehensive documents because they are not all the same. For example, years ago, I was working with a husband and wife where the husband had long-term care insurance and he needed to make a claim on his insurance to go into a nursing home. The problem is his power of attorney, which had been drafted by someone else, didn't have the language in it allowing his wife to make a claim on the long-term care insurance. So instead, she had to go through the probate court just to make a claim on that. So all these little intricacies that attorneys who specialize in this area should put into their documents, not everyone does. And that's why I think when we're talking about estate planning, it really is beneficial for everyone to work with an expert. So instead of going to the divorce attorney or the, the business attorney, make sure to work with an estate planning attorney. And when you're trying to figure out who that person is, you know, you can ask them questions. What percentage of your practice is estate planning? How long have you been doing this for? Because sometimes people may have been practicing law for 30 years, but they might just dabble in estate planning. So it's really a key for all the listeners out there to understand that not only is it important to have these documents, but to have comprehensive and good documents. So someone who is a general practice attorney could actually say, I can do your estate planning, but he's probably looking at doing a will for them and some simple documents. I think that's very interesting when you said you have to put all this language in there to cover these things. I didn't even think about that, how important that is, is to put that proper language. My job as an estate planning attorney, if I'm a good estate planning attorney, is to try and address every what if I can possibly think of and that my clients may experience. And so to do the documents and not address those what ifs, you know, whether it's making the claim on the long term care insurance or something else, you're really not getting as comprehensive a document as you need in order to protect yourself. So I, I something just came up when in my mind, when you were talking about this, what are some ideas for people that want to get the documents in place? Maybe they don't even have children. What kind of people would you suggest that they consider for their trustee or someone who can be a personal representative or, you know, have these powers of attorney for them? I know that my girlfriend is a CPA. And so she has done that for a few clients. But 
you know, going to a bank. I mean, I guess that could be an option, but do you have my grandmother, my great aunt had um, the Canada trust and they did everything for her and it was wonderful. And then she had me as a personal representative, but what do you suggest for people? Cause I think that could be another concern is they put it off because they don't know who they would ask, but that's even worse because then the courts are going to come in and the courts are going to be in charge. Absolutely. I think it's really important. That's another purpose of working with a good estate planning attorney, because my job is to help talk my clients through these issues, to help them brainstorm. You don't have to have kids to have people named on your will or on your trust or power of attorneys. It can be a friend. It can be a parent, a sibling, a niece, a nephew. And so the key is when we're talking about this, you really have to pick people you trust. And they don't have to know everything. So for example, they don't have to be a financial advisor to be appointed as a trustee. And I know we haven't talked about trust yet, but in any of these financial designations, what they need to know is they need to know enough to go and get help when it's called for, to hire the CPA, to hire a financial advisor, because the most important thing clients can do is name people on the documents that they trust. And once you have that person that they, they trust named on the document, from there, they can hire any professionals that they need to, to help their loved one out. You know, that's wonderful. And we have changed, you know, different, co- you know, successor trustees before on our trust and on all our documents, in fact. And so, you know, hey, we've lived decades, my husband and I, and our kids were minors at one point. Now they're grown up. But w- so I want people to know, too, that they can change, though, wh- whoever they name, they can change it. As long as they're mentally competent and as long as the documents are revocable. So obviously there are trusts out there that are irrevocable. Most attorneys, you know, the building block is a revocable living trust and power of attorneys. And the key is as long as the individual is mentally competent, they can change those documents. And that's why it's so important. You talked about procrastination. You know, a lot of times it's very easy to put this off because you, you want to keep on thinking about it. As you said, you want just the right thing, but it's so much better to get it done because at some point, God forbid, if there's an accident and people have accidents in their twenties, you don't have to be 80 or 90 years old to have something happen. So once you are no longer mentally competent, you cannot do these documents. At that point in time, your only alternative is the probate court. No one wants to go through the probate court if they don't have to. I mean, it's a great system as a last resort, but when we can avoid it, we absolutely want to because it's public, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and really you're losing control because instead of you designating who you want, all of a sudden the court's involved. And the the court is going to have input on who makes your decision. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I've seen that firsthand what happens. I I have a friend, she's a financial advisor herself, and she begged her father to do the planning and he just refused. And then they um, ended up with the court court appointed attorney. Mm -hmm. And here she was one of the top financial advisors, you know, in the country, but he ju- it just was stubborn. So what do you suggest? I, I know we wanted to talk about what, what are some ways to, to talk to our loved ones about this and get them to understand that it's actually for their benefit. That's probably another difficult thing, whether it's your kids, you know, and just saying, here, sign this, I need this. Um, but also it could be a loved one, like even a spouse or um, a lot of time parents are kind of, they don't want to share with us because, you know, they, they're the, they're our parents. It's kind of difficult. It's very challenging for a lot of people to have those conversations. And that was actually the impetus for writing the book that I co-wrote with my spouse and my partner. Wait, 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 Um, drum roll, drum roll. (laughs) Here it is. And I, and I love it. I love it. It's, it's going to be a great holiday gift for people too. And for those that are on TV version, you can see we've got all these, you know, Princess Di and Prince and Michael Jackson, you know, lots of stars. So tell us about the book and, and how that came up and how that's been useful for what I was talking about, the, the conversation starters. You know, I, I've been doing this 
for over 25 years. And what I noticed pretty early on is exactly what you said, that it was very hard for families to have these conversations. And as you mentioned, sometimes it's your spouse who's being stubborn. Sometimes it's parents. It could be kids. And there's never really an easy way to have these conversations. But most of us in culture love celebrities and we like chatting about celebrities. So actually, my husband and I, who is my partner in my law firm as well, we co-wrote a book using celebrity stories as conversation starters for estate planning. And what we share in the book are what the celebrities did wrong, what they did right, tips to avoid family fights, tips to get people talking about these issues. So for example, you mentioned Princess Di. One of the things that some people have shared feedback with me about is they'll pick a celebrity in their book that their stubborn loved one really loves, whether it's Marlon Brando, whether it's Jimi Hendrix, Princess Di, Frank Sinatra, and they'll take one of these celebrities and share a fun story from the book, and then every story has a lesson. So then they'll transition from that celebrity and what that celebrity did right or wrong into, hey, mom and dad, you know what? You don't want to end up like, you know, Princess Di with her personal effects or something along those lines. So it's just an easy way to bring people's walls down to have those conversations. Or like Prince, where everything was public, you know, when, and so I think, and so the, the name, I want to trial and errors, H E I R S, trial and errors, famous fortune fights. So that's the name. You got it. Yes, yes. So let's talk about that. So when we have that conversation and we want to say, well, you know, remember that everything was public. How is it that having an estate plan, and I think specifically the difference between a will and a trust and what they do, Mm -hmm. I think this is a great lead into that, what a will does and why it's good, but then why someone may want to trust because it is private It is not part of the public and it is very simple. Like I said, when we had the document set up, I was able just to change the six, you know, the trustee on it to myself and nothing happened. And then after my father passed, it's still the trust was in place. A lot of people when they, you know, when they think of how I'm going to pass my assets on when I pass away, they immediately think of a will. Because in our culture, you think of a will as the way to pass on your assets. But that's not the only way. First of all, the way that a will works is it's recorded with the probate court. It's on file there. So we can go down to any courthouse in the country, look up what someone has, who they're leaving their money to, which I don't know about you, but most of my friends and neighbors and coworkers, we don't want strangers being able to look up what we have when we pass away and who we're leaving it to. And in addition to that, the probate court, you have to pay fees when you go through the court system. So they're going to take inventory fees and filing fees. And if you have a situation, it might also be prone to family fighting as well. You know, if you're treating kids unequally or you're disinheriting someone. So for a lot of people, as opposed to the will, a great planning tool that you and I have thrown around this word a lot today already is a trust. And the way that a trust works, instead of having assets in our individual names when we pass away, which would go through the probate court, we actually transfer assets into a trust. And a lot of times when people hear that, they get really nervous because they think, I don't want to give up any control. And if I transfer it into a trust, I'm not going to have access to my money. But that is not true, as you and I know, because when you transfer assets into a trust, you can be the trustee. So in my case, I can create and I have the Danielle Mayoris Revocable Living Trust. I'm the trustee, I'm the creator, and I'm the beneficiary. So I have complete control over that money. But because there's no assets in my individual name when I pass away, there's no probate. Nothing goes through the probate court. But I want to launch into something else, which is the only way that this works, having a trust, is not by signing that 50-page document and putting it in a closet somewhere. You actually have to transfer your assets into the trust. And if you don't, whether you'd have a trust or not, everything would still go through the probate court. 
Right, right. And that's where I know that the will can be a pour over will. So if anything gets missed, or things you can't put it don't have a title, let's say it all will get back into the trust. So okay, so I just bought uh, my husband and I are applying for term insurance, because we had a 20 year term and it uh, just came it's um, ending in January. So we're renewing that. And it would have been very easily say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to put it in my name and leave it to Mark. But instead, what I did is I, I followed um, my attorney and I just put the owner as Katana Abbott, you know, trust, and I have the trust date. And my name is Katana Abbott, T-T-E-E, trustee. <laughs> and then my um, beneficiary is the trust as well. But Mark in that trust will be successor. So when I pass, the insurance will be in there. And Mark will just step in and be the successor trustee and he can access it. But then I can put, you know, details about how I want that insurance, you know, the money to be dealt with. And that's where you can deal with some of those other more complicated issues. For example, you know, with us, you know, he'll have full access, but you may not want it, may may not want the person to have complete access, especially if there's children from other marriages or something like that. So you can do that kind of planning. So, you know, I, so I'm doing this myself and, and it wasn't difficult. It was, you know, it was just, it was just adding a little different information than we're used to. And that's exactly how it works. It's just a matter of transferring the assets into your trust. You just have a new last name right now, which is Katana Abbott trustee. You said you have the TEE and that's exactly how it works. It doesn't mean you're turning over control to some entity. You're in complete control. So if you, you want to, you know, uh, sell anything that, you know, is in the name of your trust, you sell it. If you want to buy something new, you buy it. The only difference is you do have that new last name, which is trustee. And that's really a critical part to using trust because a lot of your listeners or viewers, they might be like, oh yeah, I've got this. I have my trust. You know, it's all done and tied up with a pretty bow and put away. But a lot of times people make mistakes. They either don't transfer their assets into the trust or sometimes they don't update their trust with life events. And I think it's very important for people who have any type of estate planning in place, meet with your estate planning attorney three to five, you know, I would say every couple of years at most three to five years, you know, from when you first um, do it and keep it going because the laws change, life events happen like birth selling and buying businesses, death, marriage changes. And so it's really important to check in with your attorney to make sure that everything not only is how you want it, but it's also going to give you the protection that you need down the road. Absolutely. And I, and I thought about something else when you were talking about different types of attorneys. Now, when we're meeting with family members, and let's say we want to talk to mom and dad or, or grandma, is there a special type of attorney that we really want to consider when we're getting up there in years and aging? And what is the difference? Because I, I know there's estate planning, which, you know, we think of the state, it's dying, but there's also living disability, like what happened with my stepfather. And there's something called an elder law attorney. And I know that you and your firm, you specialize in that kind of work. And it's so important. So can you just address that briefly about some of the benefits? Because I know that's going to prick people's ears if they understand how important that type of planning could be to protecting the surviving spouse, let's say. Yeah, an elder law attorney, I describe it as an estate planning attorney plus because you get all the basics of the estate planning. But then on top of that, you're dealing with elder law issues. And what that means is long-term care issues. So a lot of times, you know, we're able to do long-term care planning, um, whether someone has long-term care insurance or not, it is specific state by state under the Medicaid laws. But the key is a lot of times, you know, in states like Michigan, where I'm based out of, we are able to protect significant assets and give an amazing quality of care to an individual in a nursing home. 
So, but there's certain things you need in your documents. You're going to have a, a different provisions in your financial power of attorney because we're going to have the basic estate planning provisions, but then we're going to want some extras to allow us to take advantage of the laws. Our trusts are going to have some additional provisions in them as well. And I'm hesitant to go into too much detail because it does vary state to state. But I think the key is, is that individuals, as they get up in years, it's more than, as you said, just about the estate planning. It's about the long-term care issues. And when you're working with an elder law attorney, they're going to be able to address not just the estate issues, but also the long-term care issues. And going back and circling back to something that you and I talked about earlier in the conversation, I said, my job is to take care of all the what ifs. Well, all of my documents, whether I'm meeting with someone who's in their 70s or 80s or 90s, all my documents have those elder law provisions in them. Because unfortunately, you know, our office, we had a client who was 39 who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. Sometimes there's accidents for people in their 20s and they need a long-term care facility. So when we talk about elder law, it's not just for people who are older. Ideally, we'll have these provisions and documents for people of all different ages and demographics. Absolutely. If you go into some of these facilities, you know, I was just in American House and we were visiting my friend's sister and she's young. But she had a really bad issue with her knee when she had surgery. She can no longer walk. And she also was special needs, but she was living on her own. But now she's in a facility like that. And because the proper estate planning was put in place, she also has a much lower rate than um, the average person being in there. So, And her dad's an estate planning attorney, so he knew how to do all this, which was so good. But, you know, before people just make a mistake, you know, or think that this doesn't apply to me, they really need to consult an attorney and have that conversation. And I have this issue. Is there a solution to this? And it could save them so much money and a lot of time. And, you know, especially it could save them ending up in court or in probate. So I know we talked about the stages of life and we are starting to talk about those 18 year olds. And now we started to talk about, you know, you shared the story of your stepfather who was, I think you said in his late seventies, but there's a whole range of people in between. And so something else that's really important, whether you're a young couple starting off in your career or you're, you know, a younger couple or at any age who you have kids. Well, now we have to look at appointment of guardian. Who's going to take care of your kids? We have to look at how the kids are going to receive the money. And, you know, most of us don't want to leave a lump sum of money to kids in their, you know, whether they're teens, 18 years old or in their twenties. And so. These are all things throughout the different stages of life to talk to your estate planning attorney about, but you know, all these issues with elder law and special needs, which we haven't touched on yet, you know, these are issues that at any age, someone wants them to be addressed in their documents. Oh, that's just great. Yeah, we, we definitely want to cover that, especially the holidays are coming up right now. So it's going to be great. I think that um, you've shared a lot of tips that people can remember and share. And especially if they, I honestly think if they, if they get your book, this trial and airs famous fortune fights, and if they do want to have a conversation, you know, pick a story from that and, and then address it with the family member. I know we're coming towards the end of the show. You mentioned special needs. You know, that's for people don't think about that, but that's some, something very important that should be included. So, especially so many children nowadays, it seems are having some, some issues with autism and different types of things, medical issues, you know, are there some things that we need to be aware of for that as far as estate planning or could you address that please? Yes, I'd be happy to, of course. So I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of families who have special needs children. And when we're talking about this, it's not just kids who are like, you know, under 18, they're adults too. 
And when someone has special needs and they're receiving government assistance, we want to make sure that when mom and dad leave them money, they leave it into a special needs trust. Because the last thing we want to happen is for an individual to lose their government benefits because they get an inheritance from a family member, whether it's mom and dad or a grandparent or someone else. So when we talk about special needs planning, what that means is that something that I do is I create special needs trust for individuals who want to pass on money to loved ones who receive government assistance. And it can be an individual of any age. And there's other times when special needs come into it, when an individual receives lawsuit proceeds um, because of something and they're on government assistance. And then we also need to create a special trust in order to allow them to receive that lawsuit settlement or proceeds in addition to staying on their government benefits. So when going back to all those what ifs, those are in my documents too. So whether, you know, we don't know down the road if our children or grandchildren are going to have special needs. And so if you're working with an attorney who has the elder law provisions in the documents and the special needs, then all those what ifs are taken care of. And it not only protects you, but it protects your loved ones and beneficiaries down the road because sometimes we're planning for people who haven't been born yet. And so that's really critical to take into account. And one thing I just want to make sure to highlight is we've talked about all this great stuff you can do with estate planning. There's no point to doing the estate planning if your loved ones cannot find the documents if something happens to you. And I'm sure with your background, you've seen this happen a lot where they've done all this financial planning and they've done the legal planning, but then something happens to them and their loved ones, they're just decision makers can't locate their documents. So that's another tip I just want to make sure to share with everyone. You go through all the work of doing this, make sure to tell your trustee or your power of attorney where the documents are located and how to access those. Yeah, I actually have a financial organizer planner that begins with the medical and it's because I'm a certified senior advisor and this is actually their document. And it's wonderful. I, I went down to Kentucky to help a woman who had no children and her husband had passed and we filled that document out. So you can do all the medical in there. So when something, you know, like what are their habits and what medications are they on and all that stuff. But then you go into where everything is. Oh, I've done this for so many of, of the, the ladies that are, you know, in their 80s and yeah, around 80s. And it's so funny because they'll bring all this stuff out. And so where's the safe deposit box? Okay, um, who has the key or where is the key? Because that's the other thing, you know, you need to know where the box is and where the key is. Sometimes it's so confusing. There's a safe and it's in one room, but a key somewhere else. And the key to get into the house uh, in this one case was out in under the flower box in, you know, under the flower box at the shed. <laughs> I mean, that is such an amazing service you're doing for your clients. That is so important. I always I, I love that because we want people not only to tell their loved ones where it's located, but we also want them to have a list of assets. So if something happens to them, they know what professionals to work with, where the insurance is located. And, you know, they don't just have to wait for things to come in the mail. But something else we have nowadays to make it a little easier is we can do digital documents. Meaning that when I'm drafting documents and my clients sign estate planning documents, I can put a provision in my documents, which I do, that a digital version is the same as an original. So after my clients sign the documents, we scan those and make PDFs. And then if they choose, they can provide those PDFs to their decision makers by email. So you don't have to worry about making a bunch of copies or what if they get lost and you can't get into the lockbox or the fireproof box. So, you know, this day and age where we're able to zoom and do things like this, we can also do digital documents, which is really a godsend for a lot of people. Oh, that is wonderful. Wow. <laughs> so is there anything else that you want to share that we've missed? 
I just want to encourage everyone to, you know, Nike, I don't know if they still say this, but just do it, please. I think you and I can attest that it's so important. And there's always a million reasons and excuses you can find not to do it. But I really hope everyone listening and watching this you know, chat today that we're having, I hope they're motivated just to do the estate planning, meet with an estate planning attorney. And if you've already done the planning, pull it out and make sure that it's updated and, and you know, have that reviewer check in because all these things not only protect you, but they really do protect your loved ones. Oh, absolutely. And I know that you're licensed in several states, but if someone wants to find an attorney and or they want to reach out to you, how do they reach you? Because you also can do a referral to someone else if they are not sure, especially if it, maybe it's about a family member in another state. So tell us how people reach you and what your website is. Well, I have a couple websites in Michigan and in Florida. The law firm website is brmmlaw.com. And they can reach out for a free consultation. Our law firm works with families in Michigan and Florida. Or um, they can reach out to me through Danielle and Andy.com, which is a little easier to remember. Um, and Andy and I uh, is my partner and husband, we co wrote the book, and we consult with families across the country, dealing with some of these issues that we talked about today. Oh, that's wonderful. Danielle, it's been so much fun to have you back here today and to share this. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. And I'm all about empowering people with estate planning and trying to get this message out there. Yes, absolutely. Okay, everyone. And I'd like to make sure everyone knows that they can go in to join smartwomen.com. They can get on our mailing list. And then you would know that Danielle was coming this month and what we were going to be talking about, as well as have the link to get her book. So until our next show, go out and live with more purpose, more passion and prosperity. Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to join our free community at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.